his supporters and some of the uh, right wing and neo Nazi groups and the like in the community decided they would take on the challenge. Needless to say, Victoria Police, as so often happens, found themselves in the middle. Unusually, though, Victoria Police, on other instances of similar occasions, have found themselves able to keep the different groups separate. But unusually, last night in Melbourne, that somehow didn't happen. We'll find out why in a moment. But more importantly, what do we do in a democracy when someone wants to use the Achilles heel of free speech to try to unsettle people and indeed challenge some of the values that glue us together as a society? What's the appropriate response? Do you think it's good that someone's able to make these sorts of speeches in a city like Melbourne, or do you think they should be stopped from doing so? Well, whichever way you go, there are consequences, and we'll thrash it out with you this morning. You're with John Fain on ABC Radio Melbourne. Call 1300 222 774 or text 0437 774 774. There were wild scenes in the streets of Kensington last night as two competing groups struggled for supremacy outside a public meeting being addressed by provocateur and controversialist Milo Yiannopoulos. It's unknown how many people paid to go inside. The organisers of his Australian tour claim they've sold thousands of tickets, but it's impossible to independently verify that claim. But as so often happens, Victoria Police found themselves the meat in the sandwich, but last night's operation seemed not to be as successful at keeping warring protesters apart from each other. Text messages, many people saying it's a failure of government letting this fascist agitator into Australia, says Tony and Stephen Bandura. Why was his visa not cancelled? Someone else reminding us that there is a member of the federal parliament and it's Senator Lionhelm in the Senate, the uh, independent senator, who has invited this same man to address people in the parliament. Uh, Milo is a great orator and highly charismatic. I enjoy listening to him. He winds people up. I don't agree with a lot of his views, but he's a professional troll. The protesters are exactly what he wants. People are too easily triggered, says this texter. Have any of the protesters actually listened to the nonsense that comes out of his mouth? Just ignore him. Uh, what basis are people protesting? Whoa, well, let's ask our next guest. James Fry is a former extremist right-winger himself, author of a book called That Fry Boy. He now works in what's called the counter-violent extremism sector. He turns his personal experience of being a uh, Rob Stomper type character into now working with governments around Australia and online to well, basically tell people the error of their ways. James, good morning to you. Good morning, John. Thanks for speaking with me. Well, thank you indeed for giving us your time. We'll come to your personal story in a moment, but first of all, you just heard what the Victoria Police's response is. Uh, do you think they're getting it right from a policing point of view? Well, listen, I, I can't comment on policing uh, tactics. It's certainly something far outside my remit. Um, certainly, um, you know, in the work I do do with police, I know that uh, you know, the vast majority of them are strongly committed to keeping everyone safe, regardless of their ideology. And, you know, I take my hat off to anyone who's willing to stand between two groups of warring protesters and, uh, you know, put their bodies on the line. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I can't comment any more on that. On the tour that this particular provocateur and professional controversialist is making, uh, not just here but in all sorts of places all around the world, uh, I suspect if the media didn't give him the magnification that it does, and I plead guilty along with everyone else here, uh, he probably talked to about 12 sad and lonely people in a tiny hall and no one would take the slightest bit of notice. Yeah, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm very much inclined to agree with you. And, and unfortunately, I think... Yes, the, the media certainly have, perhaps have given him a lot of uh, unnecessary airtime to fuel, uh, you know, his repugnant views. But at the same time, you know, I was gravely disappointed to learn of the actions of the counter-protesters yesterday because essentially it just plays straight into his narrative and, and gives him attention that, you know, he's thriving on right now. And indeed, we were offered the opportunity to have Mr Yiannopoulos as a guest on this program and uh, we quite emphatically declined and said, no, it's not the sort of content our audience really 
uh, want to have dished up to them on the ABC in Melbourne on a weekday morning, and yet others have decided that that does meet their audience's particular desires. Should we give him airtime? Is that part of free speech? I think it's it's very uh, important to distinguish between free speech and hate speech. One of the, the great things about Australia is that, you know, we've entertained a wide variety of spectrum, uh, uh, sorry, a wide spectrum of ideas over the years, both left wing and right wing. And I think in many ways that is what makes Australia such a great place to live. We can often cherry pick the best from, from all political ideologies. But I think there's a difference between, say, um, giving someone with a right-wing perspective airtime and someone who is on the extreme. And and certainly, you know, we don't have daily talk pieces from the Communist Party or the Socialist Alliance. So the idea that, um, you know, in the name of free speech, we should also be giving um, someone like uh, Milo and his extreme views uh, airtime, uh, you know, that, that doesn't wash with me. Um, certainly, do I believe someone like him should be censored from all platforms? Well, perhaps not. But, but certainly in terms of you know, mainstream media, in terms of publicly funded media, I, I don't think there's any space uh, for you know, taxpayer-funded uh, airtime to be given to, to such you know, repugnant uh, ideologies. Oh, no, no, not for a moment do I believe in censoring, not for a moment mm. do I believe in anything other than people deciding what they think is appropriate for whatever media they work on, and it's entirely up to each individual, and their audience will judge them accordingly. Uh, I am firmly of the view myself, though, I'm happy to be told I'm wrong, I'm firmly of the view that someone like Mr Yiannopoulos likes nothing more than causing people to go to fist fights and battles on the streets outside where he is performing and that in fact is precisely the reaction he's looking for. Oh absolutely and, and we see this cycle occur with all forms of extremism basically. We saw it with the uh, the counter protests at the, the Bendigo Mosque uh, rallies in uh, Bendigo in 2015. I was speaking uh, you know in a confidential discussion with a, a senior police officer who works uh, specifically with uh, hate groups and, and targets hate crimes and he said some of the actions of the counter protesters even though they were motivated from a, a place of, of probably quite good ideals some of those violent actions played right into the narrative that anyone who opposed the United Patriots front were obviously crazy. Uh, people saw some of these crazy counter-protesters um, in play, and it, it actually served to bolster and uh, increase recruitment uh, within these far-right groups rather than counter it. And certainly this is what we see with people like Milo too. Uh, you know, part of his narrative is, if you don't agree with me, you're a brainwashed, delusional lefty. Now, if you've got some young person, perhaps even uh, so across the board of, of, you know, how these groups work, these ideologies work, they'll turn up to something like this or maybe even just watch, uh, you know, the news and, and they'll see these images of, of counter-protesters engaged in very violent behaviour and they'll think, right, well, Milo was right, you know, that, that these people are crazy. And we certainly know that that's not the case across the board and there, there's really room for legitimate protest and, and so much so, you know, particularly given his repugnant views. But... Um, you know, when we go to that stage of engaging in violent extremism ourselves because we feel justified to counter violent extremism with it, we, we, we're simply fueling the cycle. And taking the bait. And just finally, James, uh, most of these views are spread and effectively so online. So the online billionaire empires, the, the, the Facebooks, the YouTubes, the Instagrams and so on, what, if any, responsibility do you think they have in this, this, this trafficking? Yeah, sure. I, I think, you know, when, when I was involved in the extremist group, um, it very much depended on, on what was geographically available uh, locally. Now, any ideology basically can be piped into your bedroom because of these, uh, you know, the, the advent of these um, the technologies. I think they have been slow um, to to recognise the role that their technologies play in the proliferation of, of extremist ideology. However, in the recent years, I've been quite encouraged by seeing groups such as Google, um, you know, really step up and, and start to try and look at ways that they can use their technologies for good. And, and just as extremist narratives can be piped into anyone's bedroom across the globe, we're starting to see it also as a very useful platform to deliver effective counter-narratives and education to, to people we might not have always been able to reach prior. 
Fascinating. Thank you, James. James Fry, author of That Fry Boy, former extremist himself who now works on counter-violent extremism. Peter in Mornington. Morning to you, Peter. How are you, John? Welcome. Um, look, um, I think, you know, you were talking about censorship and, you you know, I think it would be good for you to interview him and, and talk to him and uh, to Milo because, I, I mean, I've never heard of this guy till yesterday and there's been a lot of um, talk and about what he's Done and he's denying a lot of it. I saw an interview with him with uh, Mark Latham mm-hmm. on YouTube, and you know Mark Latham supports this guy. You know Mark Latham's an ex uh, leader of the Labor Party, so he's giving he's getting some support from from a lot of areas. But everyone's just sort of saying, "Oh no, we just don't talk to this guy." I think talking and communication is effective. He's using it effectively. And you're a very good interviewer. I mean, I respect your interviewing. I mean, you have very left-wing views. And there are some things that I actually agree with this guy, but there's a lot that I don't. I don't know a lot about him. But I'm curious as to why everybody's shutting him down and not wanting to have open dialogue with him. All right. Good on you, Ken in Sunshine. Good morning to you. Good morning. Look, let's. I'm in my 70s. And let's have a look going back to the 1930s. People who were allowed, fascists who were allowed to condemn Jewish people, condemn gypsies and condemn communists. And there was the Second World War. And the country that really won it was Russia. And the thing is, we shouldn't ever let this happen again. It was crimes against humanity. And they shouldn't be allowed to open up people's voice. Thank you, John. Good to hear from you too, and there you are in a nutshell. Two talkback callers, completely opposing points of view. Text messages galore. Milo is best served in a mug. (laughs) Very good, Ben. Uh, You're all for free speech, but only if you're comfortable with what's being said. Uh, And I'm punching you because I believe in peace. Is that what the protesters are arguing, says Leslie. Uh, You are censoring Milo. Protest was peaceful until the far right arrived and beat people with a Nazi flag. He and people claiming they had a friendly police escort, which is not the way it's being reported elsewhere. Any number of text messages. Let's keep the conversation going. 1300 to triple two seven seven. Good morning. Tim Callanan with ABC News. The Victorian opposition says the Andrews government needs to change the law and tackle the protest culture if it wants to avoid the violence seen outside a political event in Melbourne last night. Police are expected to charge two men who were arrested as left and right-wing protesters clashed outside the Melbourne Pavilion where right-wing commentator Milo Yiannopoulos was speaking. The Shadow Attorney-General John Pesuto says a culture of violent protesting has been on the rise over the past two years, which the Andrews government needs to address. He says the government also needs to reintroduce police move-on laws which allowed police to manage, if not prevent, similar situations. It really does need to take some proactive steps to tackle this culture of violence by these protest groups because we're seeing this now on a regular basis. And you know, it wasn't too long ago that you would see protests, but they wouldn't be violent like this. There is a real need to change the law, but also to tackle the culture. You're with John Fain on ABC Radio Melbourne. Call 1300 222 774. Or text 0437-774-774. Seven minutes past nine. Text messages about the uh, far-right provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos last night continue to come in thick and fast. We need to build a wall, a huge wall. Someone else saying that Holocaust denier was denied a visa. Why is this man any different? Milo appeals to a certain kind of man. Note no women phoning to support him. Uh, we engage with climate deniers and look where we are. The same will happen with ultra-nationalists. I'd like to hear you interview him. He spews his views and abuse and bile, but nothing rational. So much confusion around the meaning of free speech, claims Nicholas from Upper Beaconsfield. Free speech protects your right to voice your opinion. It doesn't guarantee you a platform from which to do it. And he's older, a regular text messenger, says, I'm amazed how you managed to be both left and right wing all at the same time. Not quite sure how I managed that either in your eyes, but there you go. That's a smattering of your text messages. We'll get back to your calls and your commentary on that issue shortly.